So there's not much that these guys don't know. We're just going to get a few more microphones for the guys. Now, folks, if you have any questions to ask the anglers, feel free, just pop your hand up and uh, we'll, uh, we'll hit them with a pressing question. We have Andy, Dave, Chris and Tommy. Uh, Andy's from North Queensland, Dave is from New South Wales, around the Foss area. Uh, Chris is from Taree, very close to Foster as well. And Tommy, a little, living a little bit further north from uh, Brisbane. So uh, all anglers that are very familiar with fishing on the east coast of Australia. So we have half an hour to chat to the guys uh, this morning. Andy, since you're the first one with a microphone, how are you, man? Oh, it'll be on in a minute. There we go. Try, try. How are you? Yeah, well. Oh, there you go. <laughs> all right. I think all the others are just about live. No, not yet. All right. Now, what we're going to do first up, I'm going to... Uh, many of you spoke last year and many of the people here were here last year. But for those who, who weren't, I want a little bit of a rundown on your fishing history how you got started and the type of fishing that you do. Andy, uh, where's home for you and what's the fishing that you do? Yeah, I'm up near uh, Proserpine, the Whitsundays, and I do everything from, yeah, fly fishing, lure fishing, estuary, reef, uh, hiking in the creeks, yeah, lots of stuff. I started when I was eight years old, um, just going down to the local jetty, der derelict jetty, and picking up line and sinkers off the rocks and just learned that way. Dave, I gather you've had a similar start? Yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, that grassroots, rural grommet type fishing? A big fishing family. Uh, born in Wagga, so I started with cod, uh, silvers, golden perch. Um, currently at Foster, well, near Foster, uh, on the New South Wales mid-north coast. And I've been there 24 years. And it basically services all my fishing needs. I've got good bass up the river. Uh, lake fishing, estuary fishing, rocks, even trout, if we go up past Tari and up over Gloucester. Yeah. You guys are, are spoiled where you are? Us, yeah, we are, we are spoiled. Yeah. Because um, where I am at Foster, I've got a big shallow coastal lake, which is part of the Great Lake system. And, what, 20 minutes up the road, I've got the Manning River, which is a full-blown estuary system with dew and deep water. Whereas uh, Wallace Lake, the deepest part of that's probably five metres, average 0.7 of a metre. Um, now, Chris, uh, born and bred in Taree, the Manning River was very much your backyard as a kid. Yeah, literally it was pretty close to my backyard. I grew up about, um, I think it was about 800 metres from the river. Um, and same as all these guys, started fishing when I was this big, big fishing family. My dad, my pop, all fished. Um, I was lucky enough that the old man owned a marine dealership as well so when I was only about 8 or 9 years old he brought a little 10 foot tinny home and a 2.2 .2 horsepower and a set of wheels that I could wheel it down the river and pop down at Tari Estate and fish till my heart was content. <laughs> Sounds like an awesome childhood. Uh, uh, Tommy you're the youngest of the four anglers we have on the stage. Yep. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that you were a little fella with a fishing rod in your hand. Yeah, no. Is that on? Yep, on. No, nothing. Yeah, so it wasn't, I actually didn't grow up on the Sunshine Coast, but I live there now and I grew up in the Bundaberg region and my dad was a guide for Barramundi and marlin fishing charters off Fraser for like 18 years, so I was super spoiled with my options and now moving to the sunny coast, I got to see how special it was and got to, you know, fish on Lake Mondrew my whole life, learning that place like the back of my hand and just live and breathe it ever since then, so... So, um, you know, a fairly common story as we all get started in fishing, it's usually fishing from the shore. And then we all want to, or most of us want to make that step into a boat. That first step into a boat can be a little bit daunting, Dave. Uh, it, it can be because you've got the expense of the boat, registration, trailer, towing it. Um, so when you do make a choice in a boat, you've got to figure out what sort of fishing you want to do. Um, where you want to go. So if you want a, a crossover where you can get offshore or round the estuary or just an estuary boat or even um, just a little punt to go put crab pots out and have a bang around the racks. But I think one of the most important things on uh, an estuary boat these days is an electric. Yeah. So if you've got uh, an electric with spot lock or anchor lock or whatever it is, you essentially 
have traded the shoreline for anywhere in the lake and, and like fish it see. like um, a shoreline because you can anchor lock it, do your casts around the area you want to fish, nothing there, you move on. Um, and the other advantage you got with boats is you can carry a lot more gear than you can in a backpack. Um, you got water, you know, everything you need, um, and a live well if you want to keep fish for photos or a kill tank to keep some, take them home. And, and your first boat, of course, Andy, doesn't have to be a big, elaborate boat. Of course, we Chris mentioned about the little boat that he had on the on the wheels that he wheeled to the water as a young fella. I, I, I assume that your first boat wasn't a big, wild one, was it? No, I started with a uh, two-metre fibreglass with paddles and oars and stuff, and then I, I graduated to, I think, three-and-a-half Yamaha horse outboard. So, and yeah, I, I learnt my fishing and boating as I progressed in the boats. Yeah, and that's generally how we go. Tom, Tommy, you would have started similarly. You, you, you've got to, you got to crawl before you walk and you've got to walk before you run, so it's very much a, a transitional step as you work your way through the boats. Yeah, 100%. I actually started off in a kayak that Rob Pack sort of helped me out with, the old Hobie. And that was all just so great. You could get up small creeks and everything and just made everything really accessible. So, And then from there, I had like a little 3.7 tinny and built an old timber deck in it, no carpet or anything, and there's just awesome little bush basher for everything. Now, now Chris, for somebody who was born and raised in a boat shop with your dad, um, you were seeing a lot of people make this transition going from without a boat to a boat. Uh, what are some of the tips that you can give people making that first step into a boat? Um... And probably the biggest tip is just to not get flustered with it all. You see a lot of people come in. Um, one, a lot of them won't take the, the information on board that you give them. So just definitely take the info on board of the people that know what they're talking about, From whether it's the boat dealership or someone down at the boat ramp. If someone's willing to give you a hand, let them. Um, and just taking your time with everything. Don't rush it and, and take time to learn how to use the boat, how to back the trailer down the ramp, or just the, the very basic things that... A lot of us take for granted, but things that people that have never done it before really can struggle with. Because one of the most daunting things you can do when you get your first boat is going to the boat ramp to launch it for the first time. It can be incredibly stressful. So I guess one of the tips that I would give is that if you have your first boat, learn how to back that boat before you get to the ramp. Yeah, definitely. There's, especially at a busy ramp, say somewhere like the Gold Coast where on a weekend there's probably hundreds of people waiting there in line yeah. uh, and if you're causing chaos it does nothing but make people angry yeah. so it, it's one thing to um, to learn it elsewhere but it's another one to learn it when you're under pressure as well and everybody's it's looking a, at you it's a totally different thing but same thing just take it steady take it slow um, no one's going to get angry if you do take a little bit of time but they will if you don't take notice of what they're trying to help with so yeah it's, it's just practice it's repetitive nature it's doing it over and over again and the more you do it the better you're going to get now uh, you, you launch your boat for the first time you're all excited you've got this brand new rig that you've been dreaming of where do you go and where do you start dave you start by putting the bung in oh you know what i was just about to say yeah. check the bungs yeah because we've all done it and, and we still do it now yeah. even even yeah. 30 years down our yeah. fishing journey you yeah. still forget it sometimes it, it, it becomes one of those things where you think oh have i so you stop and look. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, what was the question? Um, so <laughs> you, you launch your boat for the first time. Yep. This guy here launches his boat on a Sunday morning into the Gold Coast Broadwater and he goes, where do I go? What do I do? Um, Gold Co Coast Broadwater, I, I'd be looking for um, disruption in the current uh, structure. So, uh, so the first rule is have a plan. Yep. A absolutely have a plan. Know your tides. Yep. Um, know how they they act in a certain waterway. Um, so where we are, the Manning's different, but um, Wallace Lake, there's a lot of spots where you don't get a lot of flow, but you get height in the tides, and the fish push up into the shallows. So I think the difference between um, high tide on the beach and high tide in the lake is could anything up to four hours depending on the phase of the moon and the size of the tides so you, you you need to know the tides in the area that you're at and of course those variances that you get um andy 
you would have seen a lot of people out on the water over the years fishing from a boat. Have you seen any common mistakes that you see people make? I don't know. Yeah, I have to think about that one. <laughs> Other than the bungs? <laughs> well, I was going to say with the bungs, um, if you've got a friend with you, yell out to him and say, put it in before I stop. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I did that with a friend and he sort of got wet, wet up to about here. Um, running out of fuel is a big one. I've towed quite a few people in. Um, and I don't, know if, I don't know if you guys have done it, but you get so excited. You, you get on the water, it's like, where's my tackle box or where's my rods? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. like, yeah, just, just take it slow and, yeah, just think about what you're doing. Because, yeah, you, I mean, getting excited is good, but you yeah. don't want to waste uh, two hours driving to a spot. You know, it's a big responsibility to go fishing and put your boat on the water, and I always like to have a checklist of things that I can do. Have I got my licence? Are the bungs in? Do I have the safety gear? Have I got fuel? Uh, do I know what the tides are? You gotta, it's like when you leave home. I've got my wallet. I've got my, yeah. my phone. I've got my keys. I've got everything. I'm good to go. And you get out there. Um, now, Tommy, I, I was chatting to the guys, and, and I said, where do you go when you're going out on the water for the first time in the boat? I suppose doing as much research as you can, and we are spoilt these days when it comes yeah. to research. You, yeah. know, you were talking about... Um, catching uh, your dad being a guide for Barra on, on, on Mondi. Yeah. Of course, going to Mondi to catch a Barra for the first time, you're like, oh, it all looks the yeah. same. Where do I cat? Where do I go? Um, but there is a lot of information out there. So doing your research before you go about what you're going to catch, where you're going to catch them, how to catch them, yep. you know, it's that kind of thing that helps bring success. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Like, obviously, a guide can be a massive help if you go into these new places, but the good thing about estuaries is there's a lot of places you can catch fish and there's a lot of information online as well on forums and websites. But the good thing about an estuary is you can pretty much bait fish anywhere and catch a brim. And when you start getting the lure fishing, just looking for back eddies and deeper holes, a bit of structure like rock bars and stuff, all that little stuff like that will help. And you can usually find online what sort of structure is the best for that sort of area. So. Now, Andy, you're very present online. Uh, you're a strong YouTuber and have been for many years. Uh, and a lot of your content is very information-based. You're empowering the viewers with knowledge. I guess that then fosters a lot of questions that come through to you. Yeah, I get yeah, lots, lots of questions. Um, yeah. the, 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 probably one of the biggest questions you get is, what, what, f give me a spot. Yeah. But you're much better off learning how to find your own spots. Yeah. And while I, while I do have a plan when I go out, uh, if the plan doesn't work, explore and try new things. Yeah. And that's how I find a lot of my spots and you open up new areas by, by doing that. And that's, uh, that's very important as an angler, isn't it, Dave, that while you go out with a plan, you've got to be flexible enough to go, well, that plan's not working. I need to try something else. Yeah, and your plan needs to be seasonal. There's no, no point chasing flatties down the front of the lake at home mid-winter or September because they've all all the fish have pushed up the rivers so if you want to catch flatties and I think Christmas it was 78 bucks a kilo for flatty tails so if you want some head up the river if you want some big brim uh, that are either coming back in off the coast or late spawners you fish a structure down the bottom of the lake because there's a lot of um, oyster racks and stuff uh, for whiting on poppers at home, it's October, November, where the spawning aggregation is down around the mouth before they head out onto the beaches. So that part of the planning, you don't only have to have the gear you need to catch your fish, you've got to have an idea of the target species you want and what season it is. Yeah. F fishing, Chris, is very much it's about finding the fish and then you've got to catch them. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for the power of observation too. Like, you, you've really got to be aware of your surroundings, not just in the fishing side, but even in the boating side. Like, you've got to be aware of what you're doing, but you've also got to be aware of what all the other boat users um, and people on the waterway are doing as well. So, just while you're out there, I'm, like, I try and take notice of pretty much everything I can, but there's no point in fishing one area where you're not catching them. Uh, and you could be fishing there, concentrating as hard as you want, but if you're not looking around you could miss that big scatter of prawns that the brim or the flatties are into. You could miss that bust up. And you quite, quite often see it when, when we're tournament fishing especially. Um, we're so targeted on what we're doing. But in your periphery, 
there's something like chaotic going on. Yeah. No one else on the waterway is noticing it. So yeah. just ob- observing your surroundings, fishing wise and boating wise, I think goes a long way. It's very much those spidey senses. You, you're focusing on what you're doing, making the cast, trying to catch the fish, but you're listening, yeah. you're watching, you're seeing stuff out of the, the periphery. Um, attention to details uh, is one of the keys to success, isn't it, Tommy? And especially with a boat, you need to dot your I's and cross your T's. Yeah, 100%. And like even once you step up into bigger size boats and you start getting into sounders and everything, battery power is probably one of the biggest things that I've seen so many people get unstuck with. Yeah. Running out of battery power and not charging their batteries or not before. It's happened to me a couple of times as well. It definitely hurts when you're out in the water and you've got no battery power. Yeah. And you don't have a car nearby to jump start. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andy, if I gave you uh, a day off tomorrow and you didn't have to go to work... You hitch the boat on. What what would you do in your backyard? What's your go-to when you're taking the boat out? I, I really like the lure fishing in the creeks. Um, just yeah, flicking flicking lures into structure, working around like rock bars and oysters and things like that. Uh, it's that's yeah, that's definitely my go-to. And um, Dave, for you? For me, um, I I probably just hook the boat up and go. This time of year, searching for maybe a big flatty. If that didn't work, I just hit the racks for brim up in the lake. Chris, and you? If I just wanted to go for a fish and to catch something, um, I'd probably just head down the Manning, like local waterway, not like the back of my hand. Pick the mid sections of the river. Um, you've got the sort of some of the brim pushing in. You've got the flatties in that mid section of the river. Still a few prawns around, and throw something like a plastic two and a half, three inches long, um, a grub, 12 ounce head, which will literally catch you everything in that river, be it brim, whiting, flatties, jewies, whatever. Um, it'll cover pretty much all bases. If it looks like a prawn, probably even better because everything eats those things. Everything eats a prawn. And Tom, how about you? If I can go for a day fishing, and probably head up the inside of Fraser, up through the Great Sandy Straits. I just love it up there. It's only an hour and a half to two hours away from me and all throughout the straits, you can catch Trevally, Brim, Golden Trevally, Barramundi, Jacks, and everything. So there's so many options, and you can usually always get a few good fish. So it's a beautiful place. No need to Are you going to go with him? I might go with him as well. Yeah, I'm um, going there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the, you know, you fish from the shore. In most cases, you are restricted to what is in front of you, unless you want to walk and walk and walk. But with a boat, you can move around. It's like having a car. You can travel, and uh, it gives you options, Dave. Yeah, it's, it's, you're basically trading the shore for a shoreline of a boat. And as I said earlier, if you've got an electric motor with a spot lock, you can pull up wherever you like. And even if you do like to uh, go for a wade for a flatty or something, you can park and anchor the boat, jump out on an island, which is not accessible without having a swim. So it, it opens up the entire estuary system. And depending on your, your fuel and how big the estuary is, uh, Wallace Lake's got four rivers that run into it. And with various rain events, one of them might run clear, so you can shoot up that. But they've all got different species. Uh, there's brim in a couple of them. Uh, sorry, ba- uh, bass in a couple of them. So you can have a fish for brim in the morning, chase the tide up a river and catch a bass in the afternoon. So it opens up everything around the estuary. It's good to have options. Uh, Now, Chris, of course, we're on the Gold Coast, uh, a bit of a mecca for fishing uh, in Australia, Um, great holiday destination. Um, For folks here who are thinking about getting their first boat, um, what would you recommend as as an ideal setup for people to step into? Um, it, dep- it all depends on budget, I guess. But to be honest, as I said, I grew up, my first little rig was a 10-foot tinny with hardly any paint on it, a little 2.2 horsepower. Um, and I made the most of that. Like, I didn't have to go far to catch fish at home. And at the Gold Coast, it's pretty much the same. There's fish everywhere on this place, be it brim, flatties, a few plagics in the broad water, um, some bigger snapper and jewies, jacks. Um, they, like, to be honest, they're very sport for choice in the Gold Coast. So um, bang for buck, like a... 3.7 to 4 metre tinny with a 25, 30 horsepower on it um, and a troll motor on the front is probably, and a little bit of a casting deck so you can sit at the front, is ample for 95% of what you're going to do in this place. Yeah. It, and you can pick one up cheap these days. It's not, a, like, it's not a great expense. It's easy to handle by yourself as well. You can go by yourself. It's nice and light. Um, 
And yeah, that, that's going to get you pretty much into the bigger water out in the broad water, but it'll also get you right up the canals and up the creeks. And, and it gives you all those options. Um, Andy, people quite often think, I would love to have an offshore boat, but an offshore boat, they're, they're expensive to buy, they chew a lot of fuel, they're very weather dependent. A little all-rounder, like Chris is saying, is a great way to start, isn't it? Yeah, um, and when, when you're going to whichever location, you've, you've always got to take the wind and the tide into account sometimes. Uh, generally the roughest is when your wind and your tide are going opposite yeah um, but like where, where I am there's 74 islands a whole bunch of bays the mainland's you know squiggly uh, even in 25 knots and and like I guarantee you know around here you guys you, you can fish in in uh, strong winds as long as you find the right spot yeah yeah uh, on the Goldie, there's always somewhere you can fish, depending on how strong the wind is. So, um, uh, Tommy, now is the gear that you use when you're boat fishing different than what you're going to use when you're fishing from the shore? Of course, it, you know, it, I guess the statement is, it depends. Yeah, exactly. Like, you can pretty much use the same exact gear. It depends what you're targeting. But, you know, just a light spin rod with a 2500 and a little short light rod. Just keep it light and you're going to catch a lot more fish that way and you're going to have, like, a lot better time, so... Chris, we can uh, have a bad habit of making fishing more complex and more expensive than it needs to be. You don't have to spend a fortune to get into your first boat, do you? You definitely don't. As I said, that, um, that basic setup's really all you need. A rod for maybe a couple of scenarios that are going to cover like multiple sp- species for each one. Um, essentially, like if you wanted to keep it basic, and that's why I do, I actually like to do quite a lot of land-based fishing and wading because it gets me... Like I'll go to a tournament for Brimble Bass have 15 rods in the rod locker, 20 tackle boxes, three big bags of plastics, and I'll still probably only use two handfuls of them. So it's good to be able to cull it back, and and land-based fishing makes me do that. And you can take that same principle to, like, starting out in a smaller boat too. You don't actually need a massive amount of gear. You just need the right gear for the purpose. It's nice to have options, but you don't want too many because then you just get this in, in the spiral where you're like, I don't know what to do. You, you're swapping rods all the time. Sometimes keeping it as simple as you can is the best way to do it. It is, because it all works. Like you, Most of the lures in this show are going to catch you a fish. Um, and if you keep it in your hand, it's no different to fishing a tournament. Like if, if it's in your hand, that's the one you're going to catch it on, so long as it's the right thing for that scenario. Um, but that right thing is, is pretty narrow. Like You don't need a lot of choice. As I said... A two and a half to a three inch prawn on, say, an eight ounce head, especially at the Gold Coast, you will catch pretty much everything that's here on that one lure. Um, so keeping it simple, yeah, quite often the best choice. All right, um, I'll pose a question to all of you and you can think about your answer. I'll start with you. You're going to give the folks one tip for getting their first boat and getting into fishing from the boat. Andy, what would it be? I, yeah, um... I'm going to say think about your level of comfort and, yeah, how far you want to go. Like, yeah, safety is obviously number one. Um, But, yeah, you don't have to get a a huge boat, obviously. And, um, yeah, think about the type of fishing you want to do and what you enjoy and get something that that suits that because it's about enjoyment. Yeah, And, and, you know, every boat is a compromise. A little tinny won't do what an offshore boat, and an offshore boat won't do a little boat. So you sort of, you need to know what you're going to do 90% of the time. Dave, what's your tip for a newbie? My tip would be set a uh, budget. Say, I want to spend 14 grand or whatever, or 9 grand or 7 grand, and don't chase it. Don't, don't go over that. Because once you've got the boat, you've got safety gear, you've got the fishing tackle registration all the other things that add to the cost of it so have have in your mind a a set estimate of what you want to spend and just stick to it Mm. good tip Uh, and of course chris a a lot of what we have in the boat is upgradable Um, the hull's not really upgradable other than you know getting a whole new boat but you can start out with no electric and then get an electric or no sounder and upgrade your sounder so you can evolve your your boat over time Yeah, definitely you can start out with very basic setup. Um, I do think a a basic fish finder and a basic troll motor are nearly essential to actually enjoy your day out these days. Um, But probably the biggest tip I've got is to go and experience it a bit. Like try a few different rigs that are similar to what you've got. Uh, Even if you've got to go and get a guide, 
and actually see if it's for you because we get quite a lot of people in at our store that um, that are buying their first boat, all excited about it, use it a few times and realise it's not actually for them, whether yeah. it's just not their personality or they've just done it wrong and not had an enjoyable time and, and have gone off it. Um, yeah, just, just try a few things and experience it first to make that decision. Yeah, it's a good idea to try before you buy. Like, you know, you go to a marine dealership and you say, I'm buying my first boat. Is there any chance we can get actually go out in the water? Because if you haven't been out on the water in a boat before, it's, uh, it can be a little bit daunting and, and you don't know what you don't know. Um, Tommy, what's your tip? Yeah, it'd definitely be to go to a dealership and talk to the guys that sort of know what they're talking about because you can go look at boats on Marketplace, but if you're not really sure what you want to do with it, it's kind of hard to find that right boat and usually the dealerships can sort of lead you to the right way, to the right boat, and especially if they can get you the right sort of budget, bang for your buck and everything. So, Empower yourself with information. Does anybody have any questions? I think we've ticked a lot of boxes here, guys. Um, Andy, any other key points you think we've missed? Why me Because <laughs> you're closest. Dave, how about you? Um, key points out in the estuary is basic safety. Yeah. Uh, don't cast big sinkers at jet skis. Yep. Because that's dangerous. Um, and just be safe. Know the rules. I know we all get a car, a driver's license, but when do we actually refresh and renew what the yeah. laws are about? And the same thing with boating. Same principle, but you haven't got brakes. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly right. You know, um, uh, you have a huge responsibility when you are in charge of a boat. You need to know how it works, uh, uh, how to stop because you don't have brakes. You need to know where the channel markers are. You need to know your navigation lights. You Which need side? to know what PFD you've got to have. You need to know what safety gear you need to have. There's a lot of things you've got to get your head around. And, and if you do fish by yourself, and I do it, I, I've got an automatic um, PFD. Yep. Uh, and some guys go, oh, I've got the manual one. Which are great. You can't deploy if you're unconscious. No. If you hit your head, and the same with rock fishing, you hit your head, go in the water unconscious, nobody's going to pull it for you. And and it is possible to end up in the water. I spent 14 years running catch and release tournaments throughout Australia. Three instances we had anglers ejected from boats and end up in the water. It's not a good thing. And one of the other things you want to do is you want to wear the safety lanyard. That's that, that curly little red lead that comes off your motor. If you are in the boat at any time, especially by yourself, you need to wear that lanyard because it saves lives, doesn't it, Tom? Yeah, 100%. I was pretty much going to say that too. It's just so, so important. There's, like a lot of people have had an incidents because they haven't had that safety lanyard on. And, you know, like what Chris was saying before, being aware of your surroundings, six knot zones, definitely yep. be aware of that sort of stuff. You don't want to be that guy racing through the six knot zone and blowing up boats on the side on the canals and stuff. But... Yeah, just safety things, really. Just make sure you're doing all the right things. Chris, any uh, final words? No, just sort of recapping on what Tommy said. It's just being aware of the other people around you as well. Essentially, if, if you wouldn't like it happening to you on the water, try and be aware that you're not going to do it to someone else as well. Like, Just keep your distance and yeah. don't be a pest. It, it's the same concept as when you're on the road. When you're on the road, you've got, you've got cars, you've got trucks, you've got, you've got cyclists, you've got scooter riders... They all do different things and behave a little bit differently. And it's the same when you're in a boat. You've got people in tinnies. You've got people in big gin palaces. You've got jet skiers. You've got swimmers. You've got people on tubes. You need to watch all these different uh, waterway users. And you've got to be careful because uh, you give different ones different levels of, well, I've got to stay 30 metres from this guy and I've got to be this distance from a jetty. So there's a lot of information that you need to be aware of. And just a bit of common sense out there too, to be honest. is more like... Being on the water a lot and doing a lot of tournaments up and down the coast, you see a lot of different things. And I've got I've got a lot of stories about things that people probably shouldn't do on the water that I've seen. So it's just if a lot of people just don't know either. If they're fresh to boating or they've never been told, they don't know any different. That, that's so exactly right. It, sometimes it doesn't pay to get angry like some of us do. Yep. Yep, me included. Um, and just make them aware of the like the issue and the things that they shouldn't be doing. Andy, have you come up with that tip for I, me yet? I have. <laughs> what is it? Um, if you're new to fishing or you want to learn, like I'm, I've, I've been fishing for over 40 years and I'm still learning. Um, if there's a club in the area, join the club. Uh, if, if you're at a jetty or a boat ramp, just have a, have a friendly chat to people or like social media. Um, if, if you want to learn something, there's, there's always people discussing different topics and it's amazing what you can learn just by reading, commenting 
and replying and, and getting replies. Yeah. We don't need much encouragement to talk about fishing. Happy to share knowledge and uh, uh, we, we want many people as we can to uh, enjoy the experience, Dave. Uh, yeah, we do. Um, and with the, the whole safety issue, if you've got a lot of people um, around like in holiday time, jet skiers, water skiers, tubers, whatever, um, the boat gives you the ability to get away from them. Yeah. So you can go and find us. And Google Maps, if you're new to an area, Google Maps is probably one of the best resources you've got. You can look at where all the holiday parks are and avoid yeah. them and get away. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's great. And it's, it's worth the money, I reckon. Yeah. Wor F worth the investment. Fishing gives you freedom and having a boat gives you even more freedom. It does. Yeah. All right, folks, any questions before we wrap up? No, I think we are done and dusted. How about a round of applause for our four anglers? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, and uh, that is it. We are done. Thank you, guys. And uh, we'll be back very soon with our next talk. Yeah.